All right. Well, welcome everybody to this live stream from songwriting to recording. I'm Chad Shank with At Home Songwriting. Super excited to welcome Craig Honeyset from from musician to artist. Craig, welcome to YouTube Live. This is kind of our first time doing this together. It is. Thank you for having me. Yeah, we've had a few chats uh, about songwriting, but yeah, this is I'm excited about having a little live chat about songwriting. Thank you for having awesome. me. Awesome. And yeah, so if people don't know by your accent, you are actually in Australia. I'm in Minneapolis, Minnesota. So today is Thursday for me. It's Friday for you. So what's the future like? It's bright. Let me tell you, the sun comes up tomorrow. It's it's nice. Awesome. So we have we have a lot, of, lot to look forward to. A lot to look forward to, yeah. Awesome. Well, Craig, I know you and I had met uh, previously. We're both YouTubers, both songwriters. We're both musicians. We're both uh, educators. And we just thought it would be cool to get together and kind of do this Q and a, um, and just kind of talk about what both of us do and really answer some questions. So, um, we already have Hillary saying hello. So hello, Hillary, Hillary Davidson. Welcome. Um, so Craig, tell us a little bit about what from musician to artist is. So that's your YouTube channel. So kind of what's your goal with that, that channel? Yeah, I just, I guess I just have a heart for helping people or musicians make something of their music. So my background is I'm a recording engineer, I'm a producer, and uh, each time I'd kind of work on a track with someone, we'd get to, you know, they'd walk out the door at the end, they've got the song in the hand, they love it, they're excited about it. But there was almost every time there was the question, what do I do now? So there was this big yeah. gap between I've got a song, I've recorded it, and like how do I actually be an artist? Um, and the landscape's changing. We don't have labels uh, as, as strong as they were. So it's, it's very independent. So people try and do it themselves, but just didn't know how to do it. So that's kind of, I just kind of, uh, yeah, just fell in love with helping people go from just being a musician to actually being an artist. So that's what that's all about. And then like the, and then that kind of walked back into the pre-stage. Well, if you want to be a good artist before you record, you actually need good songs as well. So it's kind of a holistic view of, of, being a musician and being an artist. Awesome. Uh, Jeff is saying, hey, guys. So, hey, Jeff, how's it going? Welcome. Also, Megan is checking in. She says, this is so cool. So, yeah, welcome, everybody. Um, so, yeah, so, Craig, you're focused on kind of where do people go after they write the songs. My channel is really about helping people to write songs just like yours is, but really focus more on sort of the craft and getting into the details and all of that. Um I thought combining our kind of channels here and, and uh, meeting together would give people a chance to ask questions and for us to just kind of discuss kind of the, that process of going from, like you said, you've written a song, you're taking it to a studio, or maybe you're just recording it at home. Some people do that as well. And then it's like, what happens next? So let's go through um, the process of sort of what you experience i should say that you also own dotted eight studio so you have a recording studio where artists and songwriters come to you what are some of the things you see when people are coming into the studio and saying hey i've written a song i want to record it i want to put it out like what are the, what are the things that sort of made you step back and say i want to help people more with this yeah cool that's a good question so i think um I think what we all share is this passion and this desire for music. So I think that's a lot of people come with, even before they've got the song, it's kind of this desire to, oh, I want to, I, wouldn't it be great if I could do this? If I could, you know, like for some people, it's that outlet of um, being able to express themselves and they do that through music. For other people, it's just like, I literally just want to, this, I want this to be my job. I want to make money off music. I want to sing. I want to, I want to, you know, I want to do the, the music thing. So that's kind of what, people come with but then it's a whole new world of actually like how do you do that really well and you know what what separates um kind of those big guys that are doing it from just the people that desire to do it and that's kind of the bridge that i'm trying to help people get so i mean one of those things is getting a really great recording let's make sure it sounds professional so that when that pops up in a in a playlist um amongst other big artists that you you want to be like you want to be touring with or whatever it sounds the same, but then there's also like the actual content as well, the actual song, the actual lyrics, the actual feel. So I think people are coming 
with that desire and and I'm just trying to help them get over the line with that. So uh, Megan said from musician to artist has helped um, so much can now call myself an artist. Craig is the best. I'm so grateful to have, have met him. So thanks Megan. Uh-huh. That's, that's a good, good comment, Craig. I love Megan. She is, she's quality. I was chatting to her on the phone this morning. She's um, yeah, she's everything that from musician to artist is all about really just going, going hard at it and uh, doing it really well. Good stuff, awesome. Megan. Um, and then we also have Lifted Noise here says, I'm a hip hop beat maker, but trying to shift my workflow to songwriting during the beat making process. Mm. Um, so I guess maybe Lifted, let us know a little bit on what, what you mean by that or what kind of what you mean by incorporating that. But just reading that on the the surface, Craig, what are your thoughts on beat making versus songwriting? Um. Is it um, like m- melody, I guess, like um, storyline? I think a lot of uh, when I get people that come in with beats um, that they've kind of worked with a beat writer, it's, it's kind of up to the artist to kind of put the storyline on that. So it might have like a good groove, some good energy, but then um, it's kind of the melodic or lyrical content that goes on top of that beat that kind of makes, goes from beat to song, if that makes sense. Is that, so maybe he's, he's talking about, melody and lyric and story could be yeah i think when i hear that i i mean i think i i hear the same concept you know i think when i'm making tracks for my own songs sometimes i do start with a track and then i write lyrics and melody to that i think it all comes down to what emotion are you trying to communicate right so music in itself communicates a feeling it communicates how somebody may be feeling it may make you want to dance it may make you want to cry it may make you just feel a certain way i think the the key then is as you're writing a a beat or making a beat is thinking about what do you want to communicate and then how do you write lyrics to support that feeling or how do you bring in that concept of what's called prosody where what you're saying sort of matches how it feels. Right. Um, so one of the things, um, one of the things that I always think about is the lyrics tell you something, but the music makes you, uh, it tells you how to feel about it. Um, so lifted came back and said, I think I've overproduced my instrumentals for a long time, which leaves no room for me or uninspired to write lyrics. Interesting. Craig, have you run into that with your clients and, and artists you work with? Uh, working on it too long so you feel uninspired. I think, yeah, I think there's definitely a curve um, where you, like, it's, I've got an idea. It's great. It's great. It's great. It's probably at its best. And then as we keep working on it, it kind of goes back there. <laughs> then we kind of end up here and it's very hard to get back to there. Um, yeah, difficult problem to overcome. I think one yeah, got nowhere to stop. It is difficult. Yeah, and I think uh, and lifted. I don't know if you are a vocalist or if you're a singer, but sometimes when you are making beats, um, it can be easy to forget that the vocal is really front and center when it comes to a song. It's really more about um, what's being said and what's being sung. So maybe when you are making those beats, leave a little bit more space from uh, just a production standpoint or if you have the multi-track if you're not mixing it all down to a two track as you start to write to it you can sort of take things in and out to see what's supporting that vocal as well um which i think is helpful but yeah so if anybody has any um questions about songwriting about recording about mixing craig has a studio we both know a lot about songwriting. Um, I just saw that you posted a video, I think it was earlier this week, Craig, where you were talking about how do you sort of like carve out time in your life to stay creative and how do you unlock that creativity? Sounds like you have a studio, you're doing your own music, you have kids, all of that kind of stuff. So tell us about kind of your thought process of putting that latest video out. Yeah, cool. I think, um, yeah, this will actually help uh, lifted noise there with the with writing lyrics. It, it's just, I think it's about being intentional. Um, I think as creatives, we can generally go with the flow. 
um, which is pretty unhelpful when it comes to actually getting stuff done. Um, it's kind of, you know, we do bits here, do bits there, do bits there. So that video for me was like, what I've kind of found um, this year really is the more intentional I get about songwriting and coming up with time and space and a, you know, a workflow around songwriting means I can finish songs and not just have a bunch of things started. So kind of like for the ten last 10 years or so, I've just got like a phone full of ideas, um, notes full of ideas, but I wasn't actually finishing any songs and it was always like, I'll do that later. So like the my day in the life of a songwriter over the last 10 years was kind of really unhealthy, but this year I've just gotten really intentional and figured out, well, I need to do this and then this and then this and actually have to plan that and follow through with it to get to the end of the song. So like um, when you're struggling to come up with lyrics or something, like if that's the bottleneck, then rather than just going with your inspiration and just chucking out um, music, when you've got the time, if you go, well, at, you know, 10 o'clock Friday morning, I'm going to just try and write some lyrics and be intentional. So for me, uh, to make to make it work, I just came up with a system that I can just kind of plug into. And it means that when I'm at home and my kids need me, I can be there because I know that this inspiration that I've got, I will be able to turn into a song when I actually sit down and, and you know, plug into the time that I've assigned to write a song. How does the songwriting process usually start for you? Are you, do you have a certain process that you go to more so than not? Or what does that look like? Uh, it's always melody for me um, that I will come up with first. And cool. I think I like that because I like, I like not being tied down to chords. Um, I like almost not being tied down to a lyric and how to make that feel, but I can, and I've just found, and usually when I'm driving or in the shower or something like that, I, so that's my go-to. But yesterday I was actually writing a song with Megan um, and she sent me through some lyrics and said, so I then wrote a melody from the lyrics and cool. then and then put chords on that. So that's kind of how I like to do it, but. So that's, I mean, that's super intriguing to me because I think a lot of um, songwriters do the, you know, the tried and true like hum and strum where they're maybe coming up with a chord progression and then maybe adding melody to that. So you're saying you're starting no song, you're just singing a melody. Um, do you find, like for me, if I tried that, I feel like a lot of my melodies would sound similar. Like, do you find that you are able to come up with original sounding stuff or what's that? like for you yeah okay i think i think it's the opposite for me like so i'm singing gibberish lyrics but i find when i'm playing my guitar or piano if i know i'm going to an e minor with my fingers i'm i'm heading there with my voice as well so i was finding like i'm finding the same notes all the time when i got rid of the chords i found i could hit whatever note and experiment with oh let's try some different things and then not kind of be bound by the notes in in the chords because the the chords are essentially just uh, creating harmony for the melody. So right. the harmony is already there. I, I found it was making all my songs sound the same. I'm like, oh, every time I go to a E minor, I'm going to either this note or this note. Um, so getting that out of the way opened me up for all the notes. So now I know someone watching their next question is going to be like, okay, great. So I come up with a melody. How do I then find the rest of the song for that? Then do you try to figure out what key you're singing in and then sort of try to find chords from there? Or how do you do that? Um, yeah, pretty much. I would just sit down on the piano and just try and figure out what key it's in. Um, and then it'll probably adjust. Usually I'm not in any key or I'm going. <laughs> So once I get down to actually playing the chords, I'll um, be able to define the melody a little bit more. Um, but I'm just checking into to a rec recording software really early. So just I'm just picking up the mic and I'm just singing the melody in, usually to a click track, so that it's in time. And then I'm just jamming different chords. So what does that sound like if I go, you know, one, five, four? What does it sound like if I go one, two, four? And just like awesome. experimenting with different harmony. And it's amazing that that really changes even the feel of the melody so which is interesting because then i can add lyrics that that support it so you know you can use brighter chords and that same melody with a brighter harmony is a brighter sounding song or you can use right. more minor chords or a different progression then that same melody actually has the, the feel of a more softer 
motive song. So I find I can add a lot of color to the same melody using a different harmony underneath. Do you, um, so once you get it into probably like your, your recording software, are you like pitch correcting it or anything at that point or, or just kind of trying to go up by what, whatever's kind of coming out and then trying to match that stuff to, to what you're, or to the chords, matching the chords to that. Matching the chords. Yeah. So if it's in the key of G, for example, I'm kind of just hitting a G. Um, so I can kind of pitch it. So I know Got that's it. key that it's in and, you know, I might play the, the triad there so that I know, you know, get the key. Um, I am just lately, I've started putting an auto tune on that vocal live so that I know sure. like if I sing the wrong, it'll take me to where it should be. So I can kind of hear where it, it should be. Um, which is, I don't know, that has kind of worked. I've only just started kind of doing that, but it does make it a little bit more inspiring straight up when you go, well, this is where it could be. Yeah. Um, but very, very early on, I'm actually playing the melody on the piano or the guitar. So like if it's la da 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 da, I'm very quickly figuring out what is that A, B, C, B, B or whatever. Got it. Um, so that very quickly my melody is kind of defined. Um, do you have perfect pitch? Do not have perfect pitch. Okay. I, have, what, I have imperfect pitch. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Um, no, I've seen other producers and other writers that put auto tune on kind of for the reason why you said is because sometimes it will take it where you may not hear it right away and your voice might not go there, but it might inspire it kind of to say like, Oh, that sounds kind of cool. So I could go back and back and use that. Yeah. Yeah. Which it's good and bad. I mean, I did it. I wrote a song yesterday using that. And then when I went to like manually, manually auto tune, I was like, I was, I was relying on that so much because I'm, I'm nowhere near what I thought I was singing. But yeah. Good. Because at the end of the day, then I could, you know, I could learn it and sing it properly, but it, it did help define that melody. And I think, um, as far as storytelling and songwriting, that melody is so important. So for me, I like I like making sure that's good and whatever tools I need to do that, I'm happy to use. So that melody yeah. is really I love that you said that melody um, is so important because I think melody often, especially with newer writers or people who are just starting out or maybe um, – they're not necessarily thinking about, oh, I want to write hit songs, right? They just want to write songs. I think sometimes we think we need to focus so much on the lyrics and sort of what the song is about that the melody is just kind of an afterthought, right? Like some mm -hmm. people think that it's all about the chords you use and it's all about what your song is saying. But I think what really, really sets songs apart, I think, comes down to the melody. And a lot of that is the rhythm of the melody, right? Mm -hmm. It's it's how everything is setting. Um, would you agree with that? Like, do you feel like you're drawn towards songs that sort of have great lyrics and great melody or what, what is a great song for you? Yeah, I think it, um, I think it changes and I think it does depend on what you're into. So like when I was 16, a good, the drums were a good song. You know, if it had like the, the proper punk beat for me, then I'm like, this is a good song. I didn't care what the lyrics were. Or, I, I couldn't understand them a lot of the time. Um, yeah, but I think um, I think why we love melody is because it's it's the most human aspect of the song. So I think it's the part you can hum. Like I woke up this morning singing this stupid song that my that's trending for my kids. It just because the melody was stuck in my head, and I, you know, I couldn't. I can't just. I can't sing chords. I can right. kind of. I can kind of you know beatbox a beat or whatever. But the thing that's really human for us, I think, is that is the melody. So I, I think that's why we naturally resonate with that. Or moreover, if you can write a song that has a great melody that people can kind of just replicate in themselves at work while they're driving in the shower, whatever, that human yeah. aspect of the song really is the melody. And then the other bit, like you said, is is the lyrics because we can go, oh, man, that that's exactly how I feel. Um, that's what I've been trying to say, but I haven't been able to. So, again, on a human aspect, we can connect with the storyline, the narrative, of the lyrics. So I think those two, if you can get those two things right, um, I find that the rest of the song almost writes itself and, and, you know, the harmony, the chords you're putting under doesn't 
matter so much if the story is really strong. And I, I know that like rubs people the wrong way who love chords. Some people just love right. the harmony of chords and the story writing for them is how the chords flow, you know, the pre-chorus modulates into that bit. And for them, that really, you know, that really inspires them. So for them, the most important part is probably the chords. But I think if you're writing, if you want to get more spins on a playlist, um, that sort of thing, I think the, the thing people are going to resonate with most is the melody even though i think they think it's the lyrics i think this the emotion that is brought to the lyrics by the melody is um super important so poppy paul said in the comments uh with me or with him it's always melody first so there's somebody a melody first to person yeah. so that's awesome okay. um i love that you that you just said what you said too where um the melody is kind of what we connect with first. And then we sort of determine, does the lyric make sense? And I think if you've ever listened to a song in another language or a language you don't understand, mm -hmm. a lot of times you can get the gist of what the song is about just from the melody and how it sounds musically. Um, you don't even have to necessarily understand the words. Um, but I think the, the ultimate is if you have everything like working together, right? Good lyrics, good melody, everything kind of, kind of gel and would you agree with that yeah i would and i think that's why that's why the biggest songs have five or six names down the bottom of who wrote it i think people are bringing their strengths um to the song to make it to make sure it ticks all the boxes um but i think for us as songwriters going solo or maybe clubbing with one or two people if you can really nail your melody if you can make and then everything else just supports that if you can nail your melody and then you make lyrics that support that you make a rhythm that supports that and you put a harmony that supports that you can have a song that people want to listen to more than once awesome with you yourself did you grow up wanting to do music and wanting to go into to this type of work or or what was music like for you as you were growing up uh my my family did not listen to music. Dad had a few cassettes in the car, so we, it was either Neil Diamond or it was the Bee Gees. Uh, that was that was <laughs> it. Um, we just yeah we just didn't do music. It wasn't something that was on in the house. So um, for me, we just had a, a school assignment one time where we had to I don't know what we had to do. We ended up doing a radio station. There was probably some sort of communication thing. But um, yeah, we did a radio station. So me and two of my mates kind of picked up instruments for the first time to kind of be the house band on this radio station. And from there, we're just like, oh, this is actually kind of fun. So we just went with that. So I was into like punk rock. Um, and at that point, I just wanted to be be the rock star. So that's when music was kind of born for me. And that was, I was probably 14. Um, then I just, you know, just drummed. My uncle had a drum kit. So I just drummed like, in an hour a day, every day for years, um, which is where I kind of fell in love with it. So then up, that was like right until I was 18, 19, whenever you finish school. And then I was like, well, how do you be a rock? Like, what's the next step of being a rock star? Um, so I just studied music from there, um, which was an eye opener. So at that point I knew nothing about music. Um, and all of a sudden I had to like do these assignments, these composition things. And I'm like, you can't, this, you can't do that on the drums. So I just, at that point, I picked up guitar just to, you know, to be able to pass the assignments. Um, I think as I, I'd been playing drums so much, I, I was, I kind of had this hand worked out with the guitar, like the rhythm stuff, which I think a lot of people kind of struggle with learning. Yeah. Um, so that difficult to figure out the, the other part. But I think knowing music helped me do it. As in like, I'm, I'm knowing that I had, you know, A's and E's and, and things made it easier to figure out, well, it needs, then it needs to be this. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, and then a couple of years back when I learned the piano, it was easy to, oh, I know these notes are in this chord, so you must play it like this. So my technique's probably awful, but I can make the sounds. So those of you that are just um, joining us, if you have any questions about songwriting, questions about recording, um, definitely put them in the chat. Um, it looks like uh, Paul had made another um, comment kind of going back to what you talked about. A lot of people working on a song. He says it takes a village to write a song. Um, seems like a lot of uh, pop and R&B songs. Um, seems like it's not a village. It's like a whole city these days. Yeah. But <laughs> I think it's because they sample a lot of songs too. So the 
writers of the original song get credit, the people who produced it, they all get credit as well. Um, so we've got some questions coming in. Sure. Um, so Jay Bella, I think this is Jeanette. Hey, Jeanette. Um, is there a favorite section of songs you like and why? And I'm assuming that that means like, do you have a favorite section that you like to write? Or, you know, what, what do you, I guess, what's your favorite section? What's your favorite section to write? What's my favorite section to write? Do you have an answer for that one? What's your favorite section to write? Um, I think it depends on the song, to be honest. Um, I feel like if I'm starting with a track, if I'm top lining, like if I create a track and then I'm writing um, sort of a melody to it, I usually like to go to the chorus first. Um, I think because that's the most singable, like repetitive kind of like part where you can really kind of have the energy part of it. Mm -hmm. um, as a, like a listener, what do I like? Um, I like a good pre-chorus. I like a good ramp into a chorus. I also like bridges. I mean, I just love songs. So it's a little bit hard to answer that. What's that? They're going to say, you just listed all the parts of the song. I know. Um, from a writing standpoint, I can start with a verse. I can start with a chorus. Um, I guess I kind of flip-flop because I don't want to get caught in kind of a, a pattern. But, I mean, what would your answer be to that? Yeah, well, um, Jay Bell has just said hers is the pre-chorus. Um, I think... Pre-chorus is fun because you, you're adding tension, aren't you? Like that's the part where you're like, you're trying, you've taken the verse and now you, you want to, you want to lead the listener in. Like that's where you kind of draw them in so that chorus can be that big release. So yeah, I'm definitely with you. I like a pre-chorus, but then the chorus, you've got to sing that three, four times, don't you? So that's got to right. be, that's got to be good. Whether it's my favorite part to write, um, I'm not sure because there's, it probably has the most pressure or kind of weight on it. Um, it definitely wouldn't be the second verse. That's <laughs> no, not my no. favorite part. That's the, oh, hang on. I've still got to put a second verse in here. But yeah, I think a pre-chorus is fun. And, and at least those first couple of lines and the tagline of the chorus. So that those last yep. couple of lines is, um, it's fun to kind of create that. Um, so those girls, I think this is Karen. Um, what's up, Karen from New York. Uh, can I ask, do you have a different approach in the studio based on if someone is recording an original tune to shop to other artists or whether they're meaning for it to be a tune on their own project? So I think what she's saying is, do you think that there's a difference on how you approach a demo versus how do you approach like a release? Is there a difference? Um, yeah, let me just wrap my head around the question. If someone's recording an original tune to shop, um, I'll, t I'll shop to other artists. Yeah, I think so. I think in the recording aspect, um, it's definitely a different approach because you're looking at all the nuances of like, oh, you know, say that, you know, round your vowels out a bit on that word or um, make sure that has more emotion in it or th those sorts of things when you're recording. So really like fine details. For example, we might spend three hours recording a vocal on a song that we're going to actually cut and put to Spotify. If we're doing a demo, then, you know, all that time is kind of wasted if the artist brings a slightly different emotion to it or brings a slightly different energy to it. Hmm. So it's making sure that the song is great um, and the song is inspiring. And, um, you know, we did some demos yesterday where I sang them terribly. That's when I was telling you that my auto tune was all over the place. But, um, and I, I pitched that song to Megan, who's in the chat, and it was like, it's fine because she'll bring it her own way so i just needed to make sure it was inspiring enough that when she heard it, she's like yes i like this song i want to i want to do this song so definitely i think it's just those nuances and those you know this is the big picture of the song and then this is the finer details of this song being ready to go does that answer the question i th i think so karen does that answer the question um and I'm trying to keep up on the, the comments. Yeah, We're getting amazing. comments from two YouTube channels. So uh, I apologize if it takes a minute to get to them. Um, the next question that was up there is, when do you give up on a song? Um, I get asked this question a lot too, where people say, how do you know a song is done? Yeah. I think for me, 
it's either one when I get sick of it or when I feel like there's nothing else I can do to it in that moment. And I think that's hard for some people because I think anything can be improved down the road, right? Like you could literally redo something and keep doing it and keep doing it. But for me, there's a point where it's like, this is as good as it's going to get right now. Does that mean it's the best I could ever do? No, but I have to sort of put it aside. Um, So I guess I don't struggle with the when is it done, but I don't know, is that something that you struggle with, Craig, or what, what are your thoughts on that? I definitely used to. I think going back to my system that I talked about a while ago where I've kind of, where I am recording things in. So um, in, in my software, I've, I've set up a template, which, you know, has verse, pre-chorus, chorus, verse, pre-chorus. So I can then write parts. Okay, I've got a chorus, lock that off. Got a verse, lock that off. Don't have verse two yet, but that'll come later got a bridge lock that off so i think once i've started visualizing it as a full song and then i'm just putting parts in i've given up on a lot less songs than what i used to i think if you're kind of just singing it through or playing it through and trying to always hear the song as a whole it's very easy to go i can't you know this isn't going anywhere um Mm. i think you should definitely i think there's a time to give up on it when it, it just doesn't feel right and sometimes it doesn't feel like you so you're singing this song and maybe mm. it's kind of like, this is too sad. I don't like these minor chords or this feels a bit corny. It's too happy. It's not really me. Um, I think at that point you can just go, well, let's try something new. But I think I, having it, I've noticed having it laid out and kind of putting it in a, some recording software has mean that I, I give up on a lot less songs than I used to. Interesting. I think one thing that's good to do too is is get into the habit of finishing songs especially if you struggle with with finishing like a lot of people come up with an idea and they just don't see it through i've never i've always just been of the mind of if i started i'm probably going to finish it i actually am now trying to not do that and trying to see like which ones feel like they actually have more of an opportunity and i think part of it is just from a time time perspective i don't have a lot of time So I want to see if the idea has legs, right? And does this actually make it a good idea? So um, I used to do what, or 99.8% of the time, I'm recording at the same time that I'm writing, kind of similar to what you're doing as well. So some of us who produce and write, it's kind of one process. Um, I've actually thought I want to do just some writing before I actually go into the production and then only produce the good stuff good stuff that I feel is a good written song because that's foreign to me, right? Like that's not what I'm used to, but that's not what everybody is used to, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, Another question, this is a good question. Is it necessary to know music theory in order to write a song? What are your thoughts on that, Craig? Uh, It's definitely not necessary. It definitely makes it easier. And I don't think you need like a, you don't need a huge, uh, huge knowledge. You don't need to know all the ins and outs. But if you just know a little bit, then you know if this, then that, um, which is really helpful rather than if this, let me figure out where that is. Um, things like if you, you know, if you play, if you're in the key of A, you know that the minor is going to be F sharp minor. Um, you yeah. know, on to add a little edge, you might go to the B minor, but you know that the A, the E and the D are going to work all day long. So that is helpful just to know that and to know, um, you know, if you're, where you can kind of start the melody so again if you're in if you're in a um if you start your your melody line on the a or the c sharp you know that's going to kind of work rather than just trying to figure that out but i think um you can go the other way in that the rules can really define you and then all of a sudden you don't allow yourself to be creative if you know the whole thing is like oh no i can't do that because that's not in the key or um those things that you can't go from a you know a one to a five it's two it's that whatever that word is um the i don't know the dominant uh no it's like a, a perfect cadence or something like you, I'm oh yeah 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 all those sorts of things so i think you can you definitely don't need to master so it'll probably go against you if you master theory but i reckon it's great to have a little bit of theory just because it it unlocks a few things and makes a the process easier but if you don't know it it doesn't matter just do what sounds good 
Yeah. I think everything is a tool, right? I think it doesn't hurt you to know some of the, the basics, but um, I think if you study composition, sometimes there's very, depending on how you study it and, and where you study it, they may tell you like there's certain rules or there's certain things, but it's really all just tools. Like you said, Craig, if it sounds good, it is good, right? Like that's, that's the only rule in songwriting is if it yeah. sounds good, it is good for sure. Um, the theory is going to help with like, if it sounds good, it is good. That that's subjective. So you might knowing the theory probably means that just say like, it might sound good to 10% of people. If you think it sounds good, but it's, it might not necessarily be good. There might be, you might just be narrowing. Whereas if you do something that works within the theory, then it might just open up to, oh, this sounds good to a wider range of people because it's accurate. Does that make sense? Sure. You know, and like, that, um, that's why yeah. like pop, pop music is popular because it's, it's like, it's just a, a wider amount of people. Whereas like, um, sort of an indie, an indie rock grunge thing is going to have a smaller audience because there's less people that like that sound. So right. I think theory can kind of help you write things that are, are more broadly appreciated. Um, whereas some of those quirky sort of sounds that sound good might only sound good to a, a lesser audience, which is fine. No, I mean, it's not the goal. It's not everyone's goal to be Ed Sheeran, you know, like we, we want to, we want to do music because it feels great and because right. we love it. So if a small amount of people love that, but they're devoted to it, then um, that's fine. Uh, so Jay from Secret, uh, Secret Squirrel, I think, or Squirrel, um, says that which are some of recording and mixing tools or shortcuts which aid you in capturing and editing process, which allows you to stay creatively engaged? Do you use any certain tips or tricks as you're working on your um, music? Uh, recording, mixing tools, shortcuts, macros. Uh, I use a template that I try not to touch, um, as in try not to touch as in, I, I don't want to spend 20 minutes finding the right kick drum sound. Um, and, I, and that's been the shortcut for me, like whatever it sounds like is fine. So I've got like a piano, I've got a Rhodes, I've got a, as, um, a software guitar amp, I've got a MIDI drum kit sound that is, that all sounds fine and good and inspiring. But I, the tool for me is almost like not getting too, too far into that sort of sounds and production -y stuff because I find that all of a sudden I've got a great sounding chorus, but I'm no longer inspired to write the rest of the song. So I try to write um, kind of as production free as I can. Um, but I think that the real shortcut for me is when I open up a new session, I'm not opening up an empty session. I'm opening up my songwriting template, which has all my instruments in it. And then I can just go arm that record, arm that record. And that's kind of makes a workflow for me. And um, in the edit process, I am editing as quickly as I can. Uh, things like timing and pitch and those sorts of things. Um, again, they're inspiring. I find if you, if you play a guitar bit in, it's a little bit out of time. Then you write in the rest of the song that little bit out of time. You're ingraining that into your head out of time. And then when you go to record it, you're singing out of time because that's how it sounds normal to you. So I'm editing mm. those sort of fundamental things as I'm writing um, as much as possible. But um, yeah, I think I don't, I don't know that I use a lot of macros or the stream deck or shortcuts or anything other than just having a template that is set up and ready to go. Um. Another question that we have here from Dre Soul is what's the best way to create a new sound? And Dre, do you mean like a new genre or like a new style? Or are you talking about actual sounds like like synth patches or what's kind of the, the thought process there? That's so hard. That's like a that's like a profession of itself, that sound design. <laughs> totally. Totally. Those, those big guys, the big pop guys that, every, you know, song has a new sound in it. There's a, there's a guy that's like, here's a sound. And then they, you know, they play the chord or the melody or whatever they've written with this guy's sound that's kind of been designed. And um, yeah, it's very difficult. I, I try and do when I'm producing, if we get, if we kind of 
And I think I might have answered Secret um, Squall a little bit wrong there because I was talking about songwriting rather than recording. But one thing that I do with mixing, I always try and make sure there's a sound I haven't used before in a song. Mm-hmm. I think that's helpful for me to make sure that not all my productions sound the same. So whether that's a different synth sound or a different um, drum sound or a different percussion or just something that's different to what I've ever done before. Yeah. Um, at least in one section is kind of a good something to keep fresh, but actually coming up with those sounds. I mean, for me, that's a, that's a time suck. I'll try not to get into the, the synth presets for too long. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think I'm a preset guy too. Like I'm pretty much just, I'm, I, if I am scrolling through something, I'm, it's kind of out of the box and maybe I'll adjust it like the cutoff or something if it's too bright or something like that. But, um, I know some people will get into like serum and just like program mm-hmm. the crap out of it. I'm more like, let me just find the sound that I'm looking for. Um, Dre Soul says he was talking about both genre and sound design. I think coming up with a new genre, I think that's, that's a big task, right? Like that's a, <laughs> that's, that's pretty, that doesn't happen very often, but I think what happens when you come up with, or when there's an artist that actually does sort of create their own genre, it's usually combining parts of other genres. And then they're just kind of doing what makes them them. Right. And then if that's successful, other people sort of chase that. Um, I don't know. What are your thoughts on, on genre or creating a new genre, Craig? I think it's really, I think it's really difficult. I, I think if you're if you're a, a smaller artist and you come up with something that's new and different, I'm like, what are you doing? But if it's like if you're a big artist and you come up with something new, it's like, oh, that's revolutionary. So I think it's like it's it's quite hard. It's quite hard to do, but you see the big guys do it all the time. I remember when Billie Eilish brought out Bad Guy. I mean, that sounds weird, but everyone loved it. And all of a sudden, it's like this is a this is the new thing. And she's you know she's done heaps of albums with that sort of same sound and nobody really sounds like Billie Eilish, but it was like, right. it was almost like a created genre, you know? Um, so I think it's, I think it's very difficult without a, without a following of, of people that can kind of jump on board and, and make it. Wait. Yeah. I think, I mean, I think that's one thing that I've heard just from other songwriters that I've worked with. And some of them have actually written some, some hit songs and things. And they said, it's actually kind of unhealthy to think like you need to create a new genre. Like a lot of times we're not having to recreate the wheel, right? We're not, we're not reinventing it. Um, I mean, even think about Taylor Swift, like she reuses the same chord progressions over and over and over again, but yet a lot of her songs sound different. Some people are going to say, Um, she doesn't sound different. She sounds like Taylor Swift, but that's the thing is she sounds like her. She's found her thing. I think you even have to, um, I think you still have to just find out what's your thing and do you like it? And if you like it, there's probably an audience for it. Right. So that's kind of my thought on it. Um, a bit of leaning into that as well as in, um, often you can fall into the trap of, oh, this doesn't sound like other things. So we kind of adjust it to, to be more like other things. But I think there's a, particularly in like melodies. So for, for a while I fought, I fought with my own melodies thing. Oh, they're a bit, they're a little bit dark. Like everyone else is kind of writing these melodies that kind of finish bright, but mine always seem to, to just tail off at the end or something like that. And I'm like, well, maybe that's my sound. Why not just, if that's what's right. coming out every single time I write, why not just lean into that sound and go with it? I kind of sound like a dying cat from 1984 and that's just my sound, you know? (laughs) Um, What is the best? So this is a a question from Hillary. Hillary says, what is the best way to record a decent sounding demo without going overboard on production? Uh, Curious about software suggestions or even analog. Cool. This is my jam. I love, I've, yeah. And I've said it a few times, even on, on this stream, I've got that template that I like the sounds of it and without doing any mixing, like I mixed it one time, I mixed it the first time. So, you know, took some, took some low mids out of the roads, took a bit of sub out of the kick, um, brightened up the vocals a bit, put a reverb on the vocals and that's in the template. So now I can just write and then export and it sounds like a demo. And I really, I really 
don't produce. I really, I kind of make a rule on myself, just don't produce this until it's ready to be produced because I feel like it's a rabbit hole that takes me away from songwriting. So I would say that the best way to do it is write something or pull up an old session or something in your software that kind of has all the elements that you might use, um, whether that's guitar. For me, I've got like an acoustic guitar, I've got an electric guitar, I've got like a drum kit, like a software drum kit, a Rhodes, a piano. Um, I've got them kind of sounding good and then I'm just saving that as a template and just recording and writing into that every time. So this is interesting for me. Like I'm taking mental notes on I should do this too. So you're saying like originally you created this template, you actually mix the sounds together, whatever you created with them, and then you just saved all of those settings, right? So whatever your mixer settings were, EQ, all of that, you just have that all set. So you just record and like, it's like instant demo. And then you have that when you actually want to go back and redo it as real production, right? Is that yeah. what, am I understanding that correctly? Pretty much. Yeah. And then I'll almost, um, I'll almost start from scratch when I go to actually produce it because, because I'm editing it pretty hardcore to make it sound in time. I probably will perform it better when I actually want to record it. So for mm. me, it's, it's just songwriting and I, I draw a really big line between songwriting and production. I think for me, it's because I'm working with clients and they're not, they're not booking me to produce their song. They're booking me to write the song. So I, I try and keep that separate. Um, probably maybe just from a business point of view, but even um, just workflow and just wearing the one hat. I mean, the question that we answered right at the start about going overboard with instruments and then, and then not being an all right melody is kind of like, I want to avoid doing that. So I draw, I draw a line, but yeah, that, that template just sounds like a demo and, and it's rough and it's like, it's not great. And that's difficult for me as a producer to go on. I, I know this is going to blow your subwoofer in your car out. So don't play it too late. <laughs> not, but um, yeah, it's a demo. Awesome. Um, Megan says she loves the template that you set up for her. Um, just needs more time, less distractions to get stuck in. Um, Megan also had said that your sound can be your voice. Absolutely. Like there's some artists where if you took their voice out of it, it's very generic, but the voice is very unique. Um, not all of us, all of us are that lucky though <laughs> to have that kind of voice, but, but yeah. It's true. That's a big thing with, um, um, and probably what Megan's allu alluding to there is a lot of people say, Oh, you know, when we're doing an album, none of these songs sound the same. I'm like, yeah, but your voice is in all of them. And it, it kind mm -hmm. of, carries it over so even if that's a bit more rocky that's a bit more pop that was a bit more folky i think you've got your voice is really an instrument it is really a sound that sounds like you and ties it across i mean i think the best example oh even you look at i think taylor swift and ed sheeran are easy to talk about they're at the top of their game and everyone knows them but you know it's half a second into their voice you know exactly whose song it is regardless of what the instruments are doing regardless of what the melody is doing it's just the their yeah. voice is part of who they are. You know? It's interesting that you say that because I released an album. I actually did 10 songs in 30 days. Um, so I tried to do like a, a month, an album in a month that was writing, mixing everything. Wow. And some of my friends were like, they're different styles. Cause I did that on purpose. I was like, I wanted to experiment and see what I could do. And they're like, but yet there's still this kind of like thing that matches all of them together. And I think some of it was my voice, but I think also some of it is how it's mixed too. There's also a personality to the way mm. things are mixed and, you know, certain ways that I might play keyboard or like there's certain things. Like when you think about like an artist like Prince, right? Like you listen to Prince songs and you instantly think like, well, that's, it sounds like Prince because even though it's not, it sounds different, but it still sounds like print. So I do think your, your style kind of comes out for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, a really good question Maurice uh, Wright has is what is the best advice you have for a beginner to create a good catchy song chorus lyrics? Do you want to take that one or you want me to take that one? Uh, you can, you start with that one. I'm not great. Uh, yeah, for me, choruses um 
I think the easiest way to write a catchy chorus is repeat your title, <laughs> right? Like all you have to do is repeat the title and there, and you have a chorus. Um, I think to make something catchy, it's all about, is it easy to sing? Is it repeated? So people want to sing it again. Um, and the chorus, you know, a lot of times you can start your that section with the title and then end the section with the title. That's a fast way to um, create a more catchy chorus where you start with the title, have some lines that relate to it, and then end with the title as well. Um, and yeah, and just make it not as complicated and more emotional kind of getting to the point and just saying, here's what the song's about, right? Like the, the job of the chorus is the emotional center and sort of the thesis of the song where your verses are where you actually tell the story. The chorus is really commenting on the story. Um, if that makes sense. Yeah, that's good. I would, um, yeah, that's great. I'd add to that by saying, don't be afraid of your rhymes. I think sometimes mm -hmm. we can feel lame doing rhymes. When you think about, I think what makes something catchy is when people, if you think about it, literally catch it as in they're in control of it. So I think the most powerful lyrics are where you know what they're going to say before they say it. There's, you can go too far the other way. And I've met, this is predictable. Um, but I think a little bit of predictability is amazing because then you kind of own it. And because you've thought of it before you hear it, then mm -hmm. like you kind of learn it. So when you think about catchy, you want people to sing it over and over again, give them something that they kind of can be a part of creating by knowing, by having some idea of what's coming. So a rhyme's really great for that. And um, yes. I think the best, the best example is in Frozen um, or anything Disney. Um, you know, in the <laughs> line where they said, we finish each, finish each other's, and obviously it's sentences, but they say sandwiches. And then they mm -hmm. said, that's what I was going to say. So we all like, put, we join all those dots in our own head without them actually saying it. So, and then we just remember, we remember that more if we created it ourselves. But, yeah. Um, this question, um, from the world's worst musician, <laughs> that's a, a great, uh, profile title. How do we get our songs in front of big artists? So someone may actually buy one from us. Oh man, let me know when you find out I, that I, it's <laughs> so difficult. Cause I think, um, yeah, a lot of people probably like yourself they want to want to be songwriters i want to be a songwriter where you know they dip into my catalog and they're pulling stuff out yeah. um i don't know how to get there to be honest i think the best advice that i have is you have to know somebody before they are a big artist um you have to catch new artists on the way up and you also need to network and i actually do think you have to be in a place where people are making that kind of music. So I, I, and I never used to think this way. I used to believe that you could be located anywhere, but I really do think you have to be in a music center and you have to know the right people because people work with people they know and people that they trust. The, it doesn't work the way that you just, um, like, you don't just send your song off and someone does something with it, right? Like that's not how it works. Um, I think you have to be in an area where you can co-write with people that are making things happen. Um, music business is a people business and the relationships are actually more important than the quality of the work. As many of us know, it's not always the best song that becomes something. So I think it's all about having the, the strongest relationships and being the most connected to where when people are looking to do something, you're the first name that they call. Um, I think that's really the only way that it can happen. And honestly, your chances of getting struck by lightning are probably higher than ever having a big artist cut a song starting from not being known. Starting from not being known. Yeah, for sure. I think, um, <laughs> Yeah, exactly. He said, get, try and get in some rights with some people. I, I'm not a huge collaborator. I, I struggle sitting in a room with other people and writing. Like I, I better do it myself. But I think if find a way to collaborate. So one way that um, I'm kind of getting around this is I'm just writing for other people. So I had 
and just letting people know that I write. Oh, if you want some help writing a song, let me know. Let me know. So uh, Megan, who's in the chat there, like I said, she sent me some lyrics. So that we've collaborated on this song. We haven't been face to face yet or even on a Zoom or anything. It's just like, here's a bit, here's a bit, here's a bit, kind of collaborating. And then for me, I'm happy to, I'm trying to write songs for people that they can then release, you know, and my name's on all of it. So building up my kind of reputation as a songwriter and oh you know craig's been on that song craig's been on that song craig's been on that song so then when people want you know help with a song then they know that oh craig writes so i'll approach him and and that's just building up like none of these people that i'm working with are famous but like it's it's just putting yourself out there as a songwriter i think if you if you just want to like have a bunch of songs and just sit on them and wait for someone to find them it's going to be a very difficult way you've got to kind of put yourself out there and I think something that's hard is going, well, this is a really great, like just, yeah, like a bit of pride saying, this is a really great song. I don't want to give it to that nobody artist. But for me, I'm always thinking, well, this, I can always write a better song. And if your mindset is like this, I can always go better and kind of mm. not hoard things for yourself, but be happy to, to put things out there. Do it properly and make sure you're copyright and all that sort of, you know, you're not going to get ripped off. But be happy to kind of input into other people I think is always like giving, giving and generosity is always going to be the best way for you to get something like holding on to it and just wanting the best for yourself is never going to work. So I would, I would say keep writing songs and, and give them to as many people as you can. I also think too, <clears throat> like, you know, I know some songwriters that have written like three songs total in their entire life, right? Like the, and those are their golden songs that like and sometimes they're not always that great. I mean, it's like keep writing and keep improving and, you know, maybe come back to those songs. But um, I see so many people putting like their hopes into like this one song. And I think the reality is, is there's no such thing as one. There, there's no such thing as like a make or break moment, right? Like everything just changes your direction. Um but yeah, even like I've known music publishers that struggle, they're well connected and they still struggle to get songs cut because the songs have to match what the artist wants to say. Um, you know, let's say you write a song about a breakup and this new artist they pitch it to is in a new relationship. They're not going to sing it, right? Like, or if you write a really I'm in love song and the artist is like, I'm going to cut this. And then three weeks later, they get a divorce. They're like, I'm not singing a love song now. Now your song is on the back burner. You know what I mean? So, um, yeah, there's so many things that go into it for sure. Um, Dre soul says, what's the best way to copyright your songs? So I don't know how it works in Australia, but I can, uh, um, put it, put it into the U S version. Um, in the U S you register it with the library of Congress, so you go to um, copyright. Go to copyright.gov. There's instructions there um, on how to do it. Um, the people will say, well, you can mail yourself a copy and all those things. Those things don't hold up in court. Um, if you want to sue for damages, you have to have your song copywritten through the Library of Congress. Um, so the best way to do it is just follow the instructions on the copyright um, website. You can do groups of songs. So they're captured in groups. If they are a group, they have to have the same author. Um, but technically you own the copyright the second you record it onto any sort of transferable medium. So if you have it recorded, if you have it written down on paper, you own the copyright. But in order to sue somebody, it has to be registered in the library of congress so that's the u.s take but what's it like in australia uh good question i think it's the same as that it's copyrighted as soon as as soon as you have proof that you wrote it you know so it's a good idea to kind of date things as you're doing it um even if that's on paper um but yeah like if you're recording in you it's there so you you own the copyright of that i've never looked into the the legal part of um submitting things i don't I don't know. I know copyright is a lot looser in Australia than America. As for example, um, if we want to record a cover and put it on Spotify, we can just do that. But I know if you want to release it in America, you have to get licensing and 
and stuff, whereas you don't have to do any of that here. Hmm. Um, it's interesting. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not, I don't know that much about it. Yeah, I would say if you're joining us from other countries, look into what your how your country does it. Um, Poppy Paul says he thinks the Library of Congress goes for the whole world, not only the U.S. Uh, I don't think that I don't know if that's true. I, that's not true. Each comp each country has their own um, laws. You know, like the U.S. has like a statutory mechanical license rate. So if a song is released as a cover commercially, you have to pay the mechanical license rate that Congress sets, which isn't very high. Um, but it sounds like Australia doesn't have that. Um, no. I'm not a, I'm not a rights attorney. Um, I will copyright my stuff into like batches if I'm going to release it. But honestly, I don't worry too much about it. I'd actually love to have, um, I'd actually love to have someone steal my song and make a lot of money with it because then I'd actually have somebody to sue. <laughs> you know what I mean? Cause like nobody, I'm not making money on my music. So somebody else, if they can good for them, I can sue them. Um, what other questions do you all have about songwriting or recording or all of that stuff? Um, who are your favorite songwriters, Craig? My favorite songwriters. I love, um, I kind of follow Ryan Tedder. I really like, I like how his hands in so many different songs. I think that's, that's really good. I like his style. You can almost always tell it's a Ryan Tedder song. I don't know who the writer is for Imagine Dragons, but it's so mm. good. All the songs are so different and kind of edgy and you talk about creating genres and sounds. Like every single one of their songs has some different sort of flavor to it. So I don't know if they're kind of doing that themselves or whether they've, I mean, they'd have writers as well, but whether they input themselves, I'm not, not sure, but they're probably my, my top two that I just am blown away every time I, I hear the song. Right. Awesome. Yeah. I agree with Ryan Tedder. Um, I like Charlie Puth. I like Ed Sheeran. Um, not just the stuff that Ed writes for himself, but he's written a lot for other people. I like Taylor Swift, Diane Warren, Max Martin. Um, when I was growing up, it was always Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis. Um, uh, baby face. Like I grew up on that type of stuff. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, did you take Ryan's course that he did online? Um, I did. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Me too. Uh, here's a, a question. Are there any drills that you can recommend for, for beginner songwriters? And I think by drills that would be like exercises or, um, suggestions like that. Uh, yeah, okay. I reckon if you play, if you try and write, try and write some melodies without chords or anything. So if you play, um, let's just go to the key of C. So play that C chord, whether it's on the guitar or the piano, and then hit one note out of that. So that could be the C, the D, the E, whatever, and write a melody starting on that note. If that makes sense. If you write, if you play mm -hmm. a C chord, then you just hit a G, start your melody on that, and then then do it, choose a different note, same chord, so same harmony, different note, choose the A next, and you'll find that you write really different melodies based on where you start um, or within the key. So from there, you can kind of, one, you get practice writing melodies. Two, you're going to quickly figure out what you like the sound of, and then when you're kind of stuck for inspiration, you can go, well, I know starting on the third kind of gives me a cool um, sort of thing. So that's one exercise I like doing just to kind of expand my, so I'm not getting stuck in a rut all the time, kind of, yeah, finding a different to write from. I would say for me, um, on my YouTube channel, there's a ton of different writing exercises that we've done. Um, I will do metaphor writing exercises, like taking random nouns and putting them together, you know, like, um, like love, love is a rattlesnake, right? Like two random words and then try to write sentences around that. So like the rattlesnake of love, you know, has a, has a venomous bite or something. So writing from metaphors, um, and then the, uh, um, the other things that I do too are like object writing where you're writing from your senses for a set amount of time, um, like sight, sound, taste, touch, smell, movement. Um, also, uh, 
trying to write things that are in rhythm or trying to match rhythm. So similar to like writing melodies, like if you write a line, then trying to like write another line that matches it rhythmically. Mm. If you do that enough, it sort of teaches your mind how to um, like think in rhythm, right? So it, it, it helps kind of train you how to uh, put things together faster. Yeah, um, right. um, so Poppy Paul says, I think I'm wrong about the Library of Congress does apply to the whole world, or at least that's what he's hurt read. If not, can you name one similar entity in any other country? I I have no idea, but I know that each country has different copyright laws and different copyright rules. But the Library of Congress, it's the Congress of the United States. I don't think it's I don't think that's international. You might be able to international people may be able to register it here but that doesn't copyright it everywhere. I don't think, um, but yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah. I, I have no idea. As an Australian, if I wanted my, my covered song in America, I had to pay that license even being an Australian, but I know I didn't have to pay it to release it in Australia. Got it. Um, Here's a question about oh, the AI. Yeah. What do you think? I, I've used some of those before. Have you tested any of those out? Um, no, I haven't tested them out. Um, I've, I've heard, I've heard them. I, it's a tough one. I think, um, I think you can use them. It depends on what you're, what you're wanting to do. I think there's a, there's a level of, of song that you can just get away with that was it cost six bucks or something like that if you want to use um e-mastered or whatever it is i think it works i think if you want to like like anything i think if you want to go big and really make it um like a very professional thing a, a real mastering engineer is going to be able to hear things that the computer's not hearing um, i think it's all getting very close i think as always a master doesn't fix up a bad song master doesn't fix up a bad mix so if you've got your mix sounding great if your song's really good i think an ai master is going to be well and truly good enough um but yeah i think everything before that has to be good for it to make a real difference um i mean i'm a mastering engineer and people pay me to master so i'm not going to tell you that you should just do it on ai because it's just as good but it's yeah. pretty um, here's a question, uh, as well. Hillary said, should I write a demo that fits within a certain genre to make it appealing to potential labels or just write whatever comes out? Um, I mean, I think the answer to that is it depends, right? Like it depends on what your goal is. If you're pitching to a country artist and you have a pop sounding demo, you sort of have to know who you're pitching to because some artists may not be able to see beyond the production. So I think you do have to really think about the genre. Um, as far as being a writer, I think some, I think you can write all different kinds of music, right? So it's, you can write whatever comes out and then figure out like what genre it is, or you can write purposefully and, and to predetermine a genre too. Would you agree with that, Craig? Yeah, I was going to say you can, there's kind of two different mindsets there. And sometimes it's helpful to say, sit down for a song right and go, I'm going to write a song that I can pitch to Ed Sheeran. I mean, you're not actually going to pitch to Ed Sheeran, but that's like the mindset of, you know, what's something that Ed Sheeran would sing? And then you write within that, you know, so you're going to do like lots of rhythmic stuff, um, pretty simple melody, you know, you're going to, you, so you can think about, I want to write like this and pitch to that. And then the other way you can write, whatever just comes out and but then i think it's still important to go i think this artist could sing this song and that kind of gives you some direction and then maybe like when you're adjusting lyrics or you're adjusting the the harmony or whatever within there and you're thinking about that artist but i think there's you can go both ways it's a very interesting exercise to go i'm going to write a justin bieber song something that justin bieber would sing you know and then kind of get in his mind a bit and write with that direction can be good to kind of break you out of your writing habits but not to say that you can't start from scratch and and then ad, kind of apply it later what are some things when when people bring songs to you like let's say they're they're like hey i want i craig i want you to record my album 
what are some of the issues that you see with people bringing songs to you? Like, are there any like reoccurring things that you seem to give advice on or what do you see in the, in that regard? Uh, yeah, cool. There's yeah, definitely reoccurring things from people that are just getting started with songwriting or haven't written a bunch of songs. It's normally going to be dynamics. Um, so, you know, once a song starts, it just kind of has the same feel the whole way through. So the melody might adjust, um, the lyrics obviously adjusting, but the intensity of the song is, is very similar. The notes that are being used. So maybe if you sing in a chorus, you know, like C, D, G, D, you're using those three or four notes in the verse and the pre-chorus and the chorus and the bridge, just with like a different rhythm or a different order of those notes, but they're all kind of in the same feel. So dynamically, there's not a lot of movement in the song, which means when you get to production, you're like, man, how many more instruments can I chuck in this chorus to, to make it lift? Cause it, it's <laughs> just lifting naturally, or, you know, how many times can we just drop out all the instruments in the verse to, to bring it down a bit, to give that chorus lift. So that's probably the, the main thing that's difficult. Um, the other thing that people get tripped up on is just adding too much, too much story. So like explaining, explaining their verse, which kind of has a narrative over like 16 bars or something like that. When, you know, I think, um, that just, it just drags the song on too long. So often we're like, okay, well, let's say what you want to say. Your narrative's great. Your story's great. You need, you need that context for your chorus to make sense, but let's figure out a way to say it in eight bars so that we can move on to the next part. So, um, yeah, way too much content within the song and yet song ended up being, you know, four and a half minutes, five minutes or something. So just trying to get that down just so it's more consumable. Um, they're probably the two, the two main ones that I, that I'm really trying to help art and, you know, having to kind of rewrite with artists to, to get the song record ready would be dynamics and, and just too much content. Um, so someone posted that the library of Congress, the U S has copyright relations with most countries. And as a result, we honor each country's cop, each other's copyrights. However, the U.S. does not have a copyright relationship with every country. So I don't know if everybody registers there or if that just means you have to register in your home country and then we honor it. It might be a reciprocity thing. I don't know. That would be an interesting thing to um, find out. Oops, it looks like we lost Craig. Hopefully he comes back. Um, so while we're waiting for Craig to, to pop back, um, one of the things that I see a lot of newer songwriters from a, a way to improve standpoint is sometimes uh, people use what I like to call Yoda speak, where they change the, the sentence order in order to force a rhyme. Um, so they say things in a way that people wouldn't actually say it in everyday language. So you kind of get this instead of saying, I am happy, someone would say happy. I am right. Like, because they want to rhyme that am with another word. And I think we get too caught up in how do I rhyme that we forget that it's most important to have, um, the, content more so than the rhyme and it looks like we got craig back you're back i'm back <laughs> um i was just saying i don't know if you had got to hear what i was talking about but i was talking about one of the things that i notice in newer writer songs is some sometimes there's forced rhymes where they change word order in order to make something rhyme and it sounds like no one would ever say it that way right. um like instead of saying i am happy you say like happy i am Okay. You know what I mean? I call it Yoda speak because it changes the, it changes mm -hmm. the order. And I see that a lot with my students, um, especially when I'm teaching like at Berkeley and things that happens too. Um, we have someone asking Craig, if you offer feedback or coaching on songs, um, is that something that you, you do? Yeah, I do. You can head to my website, um, 
from musician to artist.com. I don't know, Chad, if you can somehow, if you can, can you type that somewhere? Or I don't know. I can, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, dot of eight.com. There's, yeah, one of, the, one of the services I do offer there is um, song feedback. So I can do that via, e- there's different tiers. We can do that via, I can just write you an email, um, like a detailed email with some things, or um, we can jump on a Zoom like this, or uh, we can do some coaching where we, we kind of, talk about your song and then you can go away and fix some things up then we come back and reassess so we can do a few different things so there's some options there for you and it's from musician to artist.com i have do i have that typed right um where's it written it's scrolling on the screen oh. is there is there a from or is it just musician to artist.com yeah no you've got it right there that's good. okay perfect um world's worth worst musician also asks how do you feel about guitar solos <laughs> do you have Honestly, any there? from a from a, a recording point of view they give me a headache only because guitarists love their guitar solo so i don't mind the, i don't mind a guitar solo what has burnt me in the brain over the years is sitting through a hundred takes of a guitar solo i'm like dude the third one was great what are we still doing here um i think guitarists just love their guitar so honestly i'll say do you have an interface? Record your guitar solo at home, bring it in, and we'll reamp it because I just don't need to hear 120 takes of a guitar <laughs> solo. But I think there's definitely room for guitar solos in a song. I reckon um, let's not do 32 bar solos though. Let's bring them back to four or eight. Um, okay. But yeah, I think I think instrumental breaks in general are, are getting less and less, aren't they? Yeah, De- I mean definitely. I mean you see a lot of songs that are like two minutes, 30 seconds now. I mean, it's like, you know, it's like hit and run. There's not a lot of music breaks at all. Um, Mm -hmm. But I think that's, that's, that's the mainstream though, right? So it depends on what your goal is. I mean, I'm sure there's some genre out there where a 10 minute guitar solo is still like what people are looking for. That's not what I listen for, but someone would. Yeah, I mean, if you love playing guitar solos, I'm guessing that you love listening to guitar solos. So there's definitely a there's a, a place for it. I, yeah, I reckon they're good. I like them. Awesome. Well, any other final questions as we start to kind of wrap things up? This has been fun tonight. Hopefully it's been helpful for, for people to kind of kick back with us. Um, somebody says, nothing dates your song more than a screaming 16-bar guitar solo. Sometimes, but you know what? The pendulum always swings back. Sometimes, you know, one of these days they'll be showing up again and we'll have like hair metal back. Yeah. <laughs> and our world's most worst musician there. Yeah, I think instrumental breaks are important. I think they they are. I don't do them because you think it needs, like as in for the sake of it, but if the song needs it, if it needs some space to breathe or you want to, I think guitar solos are great for kind of like an outlet. So if you've done a big chorus and then you want to lift, you want to end on a big high, then to like rip into a solo while that singer can kind of do a few ad libs over the the top is great. And then you know that that creates creates a good foundation to then come down and kind of do like that quiet pre-chorus back into something. So I think I think they're great for breath too. And I think not enough people are kind of doing them. We're really really focused on melody. Um, but yeah, I think there's room for it as well. Yeah. Megan says, thank you so much. So much amazing information. It's been great to see us have a chat. Um, Dre soul also says, thanks for answering questions. Absolutely. Yeah. This is fun. Um, uh, sometimes what I'll do is cause I, I like, I mean, obviously if I make music, it's like, do I just want that music to just live under like the three minute song? Like sometimes I'll have a, like it'll be more of like a, I would say like a radio edit Mm -hmm. version, but like after that, it leads into a longer like version of it, right? Like there might be a breakdown, there might be solos. It might focus on background vocals more for a while, or, you know, just kind of like an extended mix that has all kinds of things coming in and out too. I think that's fun to do more like an album cut, if that makes sense. Uh, Judith says, excellent content. Thanks, Chad and Craig. Well, thanks, Judith. Glad that you uh, could join us as well. 
Here's a good question too. What makes a song a classic or what elements to stand out to you in a song you like that makes it a classic to you? I think it's so interesting that we don't get to decide that as in it just like some songs are, are great and they just, they just resonate. Um, yeah. I think if you kind of knew exactly how to do that, we'd all be doing it. Um, <laughs> I don't, I don't yeah. know. You can like you can name the classics, can't you, straight away? And even some of the the current songs now, which will probably be classic. Um, you know, like "Blinding Light" by what's his name, The Weeknd. The Weeknd. That, that sort of song, like, what's so great about that song? I don't know, but in ten years, we'll probably still remember it. Um, "Flowers," Miley Cyrus will probably end up being a classic, but I don't know. Yeah, I mean. I think what makes songs favorites is what gives us each our own emotional experience, right? Whatever has the, some kind of connection for us. Um, Paul says, thanks for giving a platform to give great advice. Absolutely. <laughs> um, Paul also says a classic is something that will be played a hundred years from now. Um, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, it's interesting because I saw CBS news on Sunday morning, did an interview with Paul Simon recently. And they asked him if he knew how great like bridge over troubled water was at the time when he wrote it. And he's like, well, I kind of knew it was a little bit better than some of the other songs I'd written, but he was like, I had no idea it would be what it became. Right. So I don't think, I don't think anybody really knows when that's going to be the the one or how it's going to how it's going to be there so yeah yeah awesome well craig how can people you know i know you mentioned it before but how can people find out more about what you do check out your youtube channel check out your services what's the best way to get in touch with you yeah cool so yeah from musician to artist that's the name of the youtube channel um you can also jump on there on the website so i have a full songwriting course on there. That's probably my best uh, thing that you can get involved in if you want to kind of uh, figure out how I songwrite and how I can best help you. So I've got like a, a full course, which you can jump into as well, which is 27 different videos um, covering melody, chords, harmony, um, the whole part of songwriting, even a bit of production in there. And um, that song's cool actually, because I ended up actually giving that song to Megan, who's in the chat here, and she's released it a couple of weeks ago. Uh, sounds awesome. So that's, it's actually, it's good to, cause I started like in, I wrote it live in that, um, in that course there and then cool. kind of press and then now it's out and, um, sounds really good. So, but before that, if you want to kind of figure out if that's for you, I've got a free songwriting workshop that is just three days. I think the first day we cover melody and chords, uh, then we kind of move into rhythm and lyrics and then we kind of finish it off on the last day. So you can grab that for free from the website or it's linked all over my YouTube channel as well, but that's probably the best way cool. to connect. And then for those of you who are watching on Craig's channel, my channel is at home songwriting. Um, you can go to at home songwriting courses.com. Um, also I have free, uh, meetup workshops. So the next meetup is coming up on Saturday, August 12th. Um, my special guest host is going to be Neil Dirks, who is a professor with Berkeley College of Music. He has created um, their curriculum on collaborative songwriting. So we're going to do a collaboration do's and don'ts. So it's Saturday, August 12th, um, 10 a.m. Central Time. Um, and that's Central Daylight Time for I discovered that Canada has another Central Time that's different. So it's it's Central Daylight Time, Chicago Time. Um, so that's August 12th. And then I'm also hosting a week long songwriting challenge starting on August 19th. We're going to have a meeting where I give you songwriting criteria. Then you have a week to write a song. And then the next week uh, we come back and we share the songs and we um, celebrate the work that everybody put in. So I think that'll be fun as well. So you can get to the meetup uh, through my YouTube channel at home songwriting and then also at home songwriting courses.com. So, um, Craig, thank you so much for, for doing this. I think we should do this again someday. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent agree. I'm going to jump on that challenge as well. That sounds really good, actually. Awesome. Well, everybody again, check out from musician to artist, check out at home songwriting and, you know, let us know if you like this, if this is helpful, reach out to either one of us and, uh, everybody have a, have a good night.